slides. So I am going to start a, a series on the book of Colossians, Colossians, and um, it'll take me uh, a few months, a few months to go into the. It's one of those, those, you know, Colossians is one of those happy letters, right? I mean, there are a few exhortations, but it's not the main focus, um, and yet. I think they are so relevant to our faith today. And today I want to I want to share about an active hope and an amazing prayer. I am going to try to cover the first eight verses, but um, I couldn't cover them in the Spanish service, so it's very likely they I may not finish. But the neat thing about series is that you can pick up wherever you leave off. That's the that's the beauty of it. So, but we'll, we'll try to, you know, uh, attempt uh, to do that. So open your Bibles, please, to Coloss Colossians. We're going to read uh, one, um, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, and we'll see how much we can cover. Let's start by reading verses 1 and 2 as an introduction, and then I'll pray. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. Well, most writings um, in the Bible begin introducing the, the writer God used to proclaim his message. We all know that this letter was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit used Paul to pen it down and to get to us. And though the Apostle Paul dictated the letter, it, it, you know, it, it's clear that it was written by the hand of Timothy. If you read Galatians 6, 11, which is probably, maybe not the, the only one, but at least, you know, Galatians was one of those latter, like, you know, those letters that he wrote late in his um, ministry. And so... In Galatians 6, 11, he says, See what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. So we assume that, we, we, you know, this suggests that Paul was losing his sight. And so he, you know, for the, the letters that he wrote later in his life, he probably used someone to pen it down for him. He dictated and, and somebody wrote those, those words. And so... It's no accident that Paul mentions Timothy at the very beginning. Timothy was with him at that point. And, um, and so Timothy, it's clear that Timothy is the one writing the letter. And, 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 and although the introduction does not say it, and not much is mentioned, like, you know, in the Ephesians he mentions and other letters, he mentions that he is incarcerated. We assume that, you know, most likely Paul was... Um, writing this letter from prison in Rome. But again, this is more of a happy letter. It's a happy letter. It's a letter of exhortation, but it's a letter of affirmation and confirmation. The introduction also tells us that the recipients were the, the brothers who lived in Colossae. And although the church was, this, this church was born out of the fruit of Paul's ministry, it seems that he didn't plant it. And he didn't know them yet. Kind of like when he wrote to the Romans, he didn't know the Romans. Well, the same for the Colossians. He didn't know them. Because it seems that he didn't plant that church. One thing is clear is that uh, Epaphras was the one who planted the church, who was the church planter, who had been discipled by Paul. And so Paul felt like it was his, it was an extension of his ministry. And while the, the nature of the letter to the Corinthians was correction, and the letter to the Galatians was sort of a defense of his apostleship and a confrontation to the, you know, to, to the Judaizers, the letter to the Colossians was you know, to refute several false doctrines that were confusing the, the believers. He used this letter both to congratulate them, but also to make sure that they stayed 
on sound doctrine. And we know that because Paul articulates it quite clearly in chapter 2. So if you turn with me to chapter 2, let's look at some verses so you understand the nature of the letter. Look at chapter 2, verse 4. I say this in order that no one may delude, um, delude you with plausible arguments. Look at verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirit of the world, and not according to Christ. Let's jump to verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink and with regards to festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. How about verse 18? Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up with uh, reason by his sensual mind. How about verses 20 through 23? If with Christ you die to the elemental spirit of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings? These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So see, that was the purpose. Paul wanted to write this letter because he understood that some of the brothers were being confused by false doctrines. It wasn't, it doesn't seem like it was a major deal, like, you know, like the Galatians, for instance, they were really were at the deep end. But it seems like the Colossians understood, you know, they, they, they were confused a little bit, but they were, you know, the, their, their issues were not uh, deep-rooted yet. Colossae was located southwest of what is now modern um, Turkey, um, about 40 miles from uh, the city of uh, Laodicea. If you remember, it is mentioned in Revelation 3. So, you know, that I think gives us a, a better picture, right, of where uh, Colossae was situated and, and the nature of, of the letter. But Paul starts in verse 3, uh, three uh, and 4, he starts with, you know, expressing his gratitude and, you know, knowing Paul. Uh, he wants to make sure that he just doesn't say, thank you, right? Paul wasn't like that. He wanted to express his gratitude and articulate it in a way that everyone would understand the purpose as to why we need to be thankful. Let's read, let's go back to chapter 1, verses Three and four. He says, we always, now he uses we because he's with Timothy, right? We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Let's pause there. After his greeting, greetings in verses one and two, Paul expresses thanks to God, but, but he intertwines God's you know, excellence in, in, in human availability. He, he, he's trying to, you know, in his thanks, he's trying to make sure that we understand not just who God is, his sovereignty, but also what humanity is and why we need to be grateful to the sovereign God. He, he first gives thanks to God for them, explaining that this is not some man-made God. He is the Father of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, maybe to us it doesn't, it doesn't quite make sense to us because we don't live in that context. Although some of the elements, some of the things, if we jump from that time back to our time, there, there's so many similarities. Not in terms of what gods they, they worshipped, but in terms of, you know, of, of, you know the, the vibes and, and, and you know, the, the, the trends. It was very similar. 
that distinction is especially important. In, in Colossae, there were many who still worshipped the statue of Colossus. That's why the, the city was named Colossae. Colossus was a gigantic figure that the Greeks built at the entrance of the port of the, uh, port, uh, of the island of Rhodes. In fact, it was one of the seven wonders of, the, of antiquity, right? So it was a statue, it was like, like, like the Statue of Liberty. I don't know if you, how many of you have gone to New York and have, have been to the Statue of Liberty? A few of you, all right? Most of you, I think, have seen the Statue of Liberty at the corner selling insurance. I'm not referring to that one, okay? <laughs> but the first time that I went uh, to New York a few years ago, they, um, you know, we, we got, we, we got on, this, on this boat, and it was, it, you know, it looked very distant. I, I mean, um, you know, the Hudson River uh, sort of ends at, at the Atlantic Ocean. And then if you, if you come from the, the Atlantic Ocean, on the left-hand side is the Statue of Liberty. On the right-hand side is New York or Manhattan, right? And so you come from the other end, from, from Newark, from, you know, Newark, uh, New Jersey. And so you get on the boat, sometimes you're from New York as well, but you, you know, get on the boat, and as you get closer to it, you, you start realizing, you know, far in the distance, you see this tiny little, you know, statue, right? But as you get closer, you like, you start looking like this, like this, it's like, and then all of a sudden, you're, when, when it, you know, when it stops, it's all the way up, and you're thinking, how in the world did they build this thing here? It's so, you know, it's so impressive, right? And the best thing of all is that you can actually get up there. You can climb, you know, through these stairs all the way. And, uh, uh, you know, where, where she has, you know, the statue has this little, I don't know, diadem or something. You know, you can, you can actually look, right, holding on for dear life because it's so way up there. It's so impressive. Now, that's impressive to us nowadays. Can you imagine back then when people... You know, when they were on the boat and were cl getting closer to the island of Rhodes and this gigantic figure appeared on, you know, just on the horizon. Well, of course, by the time Paul writes this letter, uh, you know, the, the statue of Col uh, Colossus was, was not there anymore. But people still worshipped the statue. And in fact, many other Greek uh, and Roman gods plagued Colossae, which... which which made it difficult to share the God of the Bible because everyone couldn't invent their own God. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? You know, we don't live in a culture where, you know, where Greek and Roman gods uh, abound, but we do live in a culture where anyone can invent their own God and worship it. Right? I mean, we have a make American Idol, for, for goodness sake. What else do you expect? I mean, we worship, you know, or, or the culture worships, that is. The culture worships, um, you know, the, the, the stars and the singers and, you know, and so on. And, and so we're not, you know, they were, we're not too far from the reality that the Colossians um, lived in. Paul is only establishing that the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament in this context. But now, you know, this God who was revealed in the Old Testament has now revealed to us in the New Testament His Son, Jesus Christ, the most, um, the, the most wonderful secret of all eternity. Jesus, His Son, the God's Son, who came in the flesh and, uh, to reveal the plan of salvation to anyone who believes. Paul wants to make sure that they understand that our gratitude or his gratitude was expressed to the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not just any little God, right? And, and being Paul again, you know, he has to express his long, this lo very long gratitude. Verse 4 says that he and Timothy heard. Now, he didn't hear gossip like those of Corinth or slander like those of, of, of Galatia. No, they, they heard of their faith in Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? I, I, you know, I'd like to ask, if, if the person who brought us to Christ heard about us, what would they hear? 
Think of who brought you to Christ. Was it your mom, your uncle, or a friend, or anyone? Or anyone who was, who was used by God to bring you to Christ? What would that person hear about you right now? Would they hear that we have a genuine faith in Christ? That we are rooted in sound doctrine of the gospel? How do, you, how, you know, how do Paul and, and Timothy, uh, you know, how, how did they know that their faith was neither minimized or, or nor exaggerated? Well, it's very simple. Verse 4 says that they heard of the love that you have for all the saints. That's how they knew. And so I ask you, do you love all the saints? Or only the ones you like. You don't have to look, next, you know, you don't have to turn your, your, your head, but do you love the same next to you? Hmm? Do you love that same every single day with the same commitment and loyalty? Do you? Hmm. See? Do you love that same when you're mad? Or only when you are happy? That's a, that's a very good question. Because the fact is that we know someone loves God when they love their brothers. When they love the saints. And I, I have to say, I have to say that to love the saints, it means that you love, you love the saints in their entirety. Not just the things that you like about that saint. Yeah. If the saints were like software, we would love to, you know, reprogram or erase some of the, you know, some, some of the code so that they would behave according to our own expectations. Right? I think we, when we think of, of the saints, we always think, you know, the things that we love about that saint and the things that we don't quite like. Yeah. Do you love the spiritual elders who God has placed to guide you? Or do you love only those who tell you what you want to hear? I mean, Jesus puts it, I mean, uh, the apostle John puts it this way in 1 John 4.20. He says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother... He is a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. It's a, it's a mathematical equation. It's very simple. Our love really is measured, our love for God is measured by how much we love the saints, how much we love the church. How much we love the people who are imperfect and broken and, and still aching and, and limping, you know, as they walk with God. We are, we love the saints when we love the entirety of the person. The wholeness. The whole bag, the whole, the whole of it. When you marry, you have to marry the entire person, not just the little things that you like about that person right now. Not just the fact that he pays for the meals or he has a good job or she, you know, she, she's beautiful and, and then not just that. You have to love their brokenness too. Because I assure you the most beautiful person here has a blind spot. Has a limp. Hmm. Paul is grateful to God you know, for, for these brothers, because they loved God and the brethren. See? Sons-in-law loved their mothers-in-law, and mothers-in-law loved their daughters-in-law, and parents loved their children, and children loved their parents. And they also loved the lost. Brother Sugar loved his wife, Water, and united in love, reached... Mr. Sinner, Mr. Uh, you know, Sinner, Mr. Lime, and together, when Mr. Lime came to Christ, together they made lemonade for this thirsty world. That's how it works. Hmm? 
And I'm, I'm not even discussing Brother Nopal and Sister Rosa. You, you, you know, I mean, the Spirit is giving you some discernment about it, right? The point is, we're not all together. We're not, we're not all together. We're not, we're not put together yet. We're, we're getting there. But we must love each other. Paul was grateful to God because the brothers in Colossae loved God and their brothers. He was also grateful for, 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 the, for their acting hope, you know, for their acting hope. Their, their, their hope was active. It wasn't some, some kind of, you know, conceptual hope. Some hypothetical idea. Some pie in the sky. He understood. He, he understood that they had this very active hope. Knowing how, you know, long-winded Paul could be, he, he goes on with, with his gratitude. You know, this, this time he focuses, you know, verses five, 5 and 6, he, he focuses on their acting hope. And, and, and you know, of course, they, they loved God and their brothers, but they also loved the lost. Look at verses uh, 5 and 6. It says, because of the hope laid up for you. He's talking about having heard of their faith. And their faith that, that, that was, you know, was laid up for them in heaven. And it goes on saying, of this you have heard before in the word, in, in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. I mean, Paul is, Paul is saying a lot of things here. I mean, three times, in these verses, three times he, he says, we heard of your faith. When you heard of the faith, and now the, the lost are hearing of you, of your faith. Paul heard of their faith because they heard the gospel and now the entire world is hearing the gospel through them. This is sort of an echo of Romans 10, 17, where Paul says that, that hearing of the word of God creates more faith to hear more of the word of God. The more you hear the word of God, the more you want to hear it. I don't know about you, but if you ever listen to a good sermon, let's say you're driving or you know, doing, some, you know, cleaning the house or whatever, and you're listening to a good sermon, but, you know, by the time you end it, you want more. There is, there is this an increasing effect of, of the Word of God. The more you hear it, the more you want it. And Paul is thankful for this because they heard the gospel. Now they want to hear even more. In verse 5, Paul continues to thank God, but, but here he, he gives us a colossal clue about their motivation. What, what motivated them to share the gospel? You know, the, the love they had for Christ and, and their brothers. Paul discovers that their love for God and their brothers was anchored, listen, literally anchored in heaven. I mean, look at verse Five again, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Their hope was not anchored in Paul for having written the letter. They did not believe because Epaphras had led them to Christ. Nor did they believe because they were now financially better off. They believed, listen, because... Now they hope to get to heaven, and that's as simple as that. And that's one thing we often forget. They not only believed in the crucifixion of Christ, not only did they embrace the resurrection of Jesus, but they also believed in his ascension as the Son of God, and that soon they would also be sitting together with him in heavenly places. And we're looking forward to that. Kind of like Chris was saying, if this worship is good, can you imagine when we get to heaven? I'll be able to harmonize. Finally. And I'll be able to sing in any key. Finally. And I'll be able to play an instrument. Uh, finally. I, I will be able to do that. And, 
instead of being quiet because my, you know, I don't, I don't have a good pitch. I'll, I'll be able to somehow, somehow, I'll be able to worship God. I don't want to minimize this, this, this important truth. But, you know, Paul develops this topic when he writes to the brothers in Ephesus. This is very important. Our hope in heaven is a very important topic in Scripture. See? In fact, when you read Ephesians, you, will, you, you find out about this topic. Paul mentions, mentions it again and again. Let's, let's look at you know, some, some passages here. I'm going to show them here to you. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every, with every, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So the best blessings are not here, though God has blessed us greatly, hasn't he? Has he blessed you yet? I think so. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how many blessings are still waiting for you in heaven? And speaking of the supremacy of Jesus, Operating in us, Paul says in, in, you know, in Ephesians 1.20, he says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So where is Jesus right now? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. And Hebrews says that that's where, you know, he's, he's interceding on our behalf from them, from that place. You know, but, but, but Christ not only rose to sit in the supreme place in heaven. Ephesians 2, 6 says, and raised us up, raised you up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So physically, where are you sitting physically right now? Right here. Right? Come on, paint yourself just to make sure you're still alive. Right? You're sitting right here. But at the same time, listen, at the same time, you have a reservation or a reserved seat in heaven. And don't worry about it. It has your name. You, no one is going to take it away from you anymore. You know, you, you, won't, you won't come like, you know, the church and sometimes you're like, oh, man, they took my seat. Well, you know, not so much here in, this, in the English service. But, you know, but no, it won't, it won't be like that. There will be... A seat specially designed for you. Yeah. That's great. Those of us who have used the seat for a number of years, I mean, it even takes the form, right? That's why we like it. It feels, you know, comfy. But in heaven, it will be custom made. Either that or our body will be custom made. I don't know what's going to happen, but the, the point is that we have been seated with him in heavenly places. So Christ already sees us sitting with him. He can't wait to have us sit with him, to have the supper, to celebrate the bride, you know, to, to celebrate the, the, the coming of this bride that will marry him forever and ever. Why does Paul want us to know where we are going to sit in the next life? Well, he says it. And in Ephesians 3.10, he says, So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now, might now, not in heaven, might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. In other words, our, 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 our hope is in heaven. But our, you know, our task is right here, right now. We must make known God to people. People need to know that the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ wants to be worshipped through His Son, Jesus. And that people have now the chance to come to Him and to believe. Most people believe. They just want to believe everything. But God is calling them to believe in His Son because only His Son has paid for their sin. The Colossians weren't wasting their time waiting for the latest fashion from France or the newest car from Japan or their dream home away from the barrio, from, you know, from the ghetto, right? Or, 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 or a handsome fiancé for their daughter. No, they, they had understood that their hope was not here on earth, right? 
Their hope was better than Harvard for those of you who want to go to an Ivy League college. It's better, believe me. In the magazine of September 1993, page three, a focus on the family. I have a you know a bunch of magazines I collected over the years, but you know I found this story uh, you know, right after I had the heart attack that really captivated my my attention. The author says that on a missionary trip to Africa that he made, he met a five-year-old boy who um, marked his life. He says that Gracie Schaeffler, the nurse, was caring for that child during the last days of his life. You see, uh, he was dying from lung, lung cancer, which is Ter a terrifying disease in the final days, um, in the final stages of it. The lungs fill, you know, with fluid and the patient cannot breathe. It's just it's terrible, especially for a small child. The little boy had a Christian mother who loved him dearly and stayed by his side while the husband was working. She stayed there as, as, as much as she could throughout the long trial. She wrapped him in, a, you know, and she would wrap, wrap him and, you know, sit him on, his, on her lap and speak softly to him about the Lord. The author says that instinctively the, the woman was preparing his, her son for the final hours to come. She had been warned how it was going to be. Gracie, the nurse, says that one day she came into the room as death was approaching and she heard the child whisper, the bells, the bells are ringing. Mommy, I can hear the bells. Gracie thought that he was hallucinating because, you know, he was already in the last moments of his life. She left and returned a few minutes later, and she again heard him talking about the ringing bells. Then she said to her mother, Ma'am, I'm sure that you know that your baby, you know, hear things that don't exist. He's hallucinating because of the illness. The mother pressed her child against her chest, and with a smile that she never forgot. She said, no, Nurse Schaeffler, he's not hallucinating. I told him that when he was scared or couldn't breathe, if he listened carefully, he would hear the bells of heaven that were ringing to welcome him. That's what my child has been talking about all day. That precious, precious child died in his mother's lap that night and he was still talking about the ringing bells of heaven when the angel came to take him home. Are we living that heavenly hope? Do we understand that the only thing standing between hell and heaven for our unbelieving friends and relative is, relatives is, is our witness? Have we forgotten the transformative power of the gospel in exchange for bitterness, anger, and boring traditionalism? Are we looking up to heaven? or still navel-gazing, navel waiting for pity from others. You know, this heavenly hope was transforming the brothers in, in such a way that they loved Christ. They loved their brothers and, 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 and were now reaching out to their friends. And this heavenly hope was, was growing throughout the entire region because they were so engaged, they were so in love with God that other people, other little cities 
cantons and, and little towns were hearing the gospel through their witness. You know, one reason I travel to Mexico once a year is because God's work you know, is growing mightily there. And, and our Mexican brothers are not stuck in, in caves in fear, you know, drug traffickers, but rather they're reaching out to others. And, and every single time I go there, I see how the, the work is growing. And it's just, a, it's just amazing. And they do it because there are still empty seats in heaven, and they want the empty hell to fill heaven. This year, I will also take advantage of you know, my vacation days to travel to, to El Salvador, El Oriente, with my wife to be present at the inauguration for the school that Brother Enot and Gloria Rubio uh, built to benefit the youth of, of the, that little town, El Piche. Well, the work of God is, is working, is growing there too. And every single time we go there, you know, there is a beautiful welcome, but also I see the growth and, 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 and you know, the, ferv the fervor that the brothers have to share the gospel and I have go with them and share the good news with their neighbors and, and in, their, in their services. There's, there's, there's this, you know, they, they know that heaven is closer than hell for them. That eternity is very close to them, and they want to make sure that everyone knows about Christ. I will also travel to Uspantan, is in western Guatemala, because the work is growing among our brothers who speak Quiche. I don't speak Quiche, but we'll figure it out. I've already done it with people who didn't understand when I was young, a young boy among the Sutu Hills, so we'll figure it out. I understand why Paul and Timothy were grateful. Because when you see the work of God growing and you see people loving God and loving the brethren and loving the lost, you get excited about it and you praise God and there's a lot more gratitude. Paul and Timothy were grateful, and their gratitude extends also to Epaphras, who demonstrated love for the lost. I'm going to end there, and I'll pick up there next time. But we must be grateful, like Paul, that God's work continues and, and does not stop. It's not confined to us. It's not confined to Wellspring. It's not confined to, you know, this city. I mean, the work of God keeps growing. And God wants to use us. We must have an active hope like the Colossians who were shining in the dark world where they lived. You know, as terrible as this world is, as dark as it is, it is just a little better because you are in it. Because you have Christ in you, and the Christ in you is shining, and just the presence of Christ in you makes your world a little, just a little, tiny little better. A little better. And your presence can bring so much hope to those around you, to those people who have, who have lost hope, human hope. They need a different kind of hope, a hope that is celestial, a hope that is beyond, you know, the mundane, beyond the nitty-gritty of life, beyond the disappointments, a hope that will not disappoint them in any way. And we must also imitate the faith of those who brought us to Christ and have stayed faithful, having Love for the lost until they also embrace heavenly, the heavenly hope like we have. So many people are, are being lost. And while we're not the hope, we are the carriers of that hope.